Amen. Now I've got to preach behind that. What have I done? <laughs> thank you, Sister Donna, for bringing him also. And thank all of you for joining with us today as we celebrate 150 years of preaching the pure gospel in Calumet region. Amen. I want to talk today about focus. Focus. I think it's appropriate that we look at that because there is so much going on today that it's so easy to lose sight of our focus. You know, St. John of the Cross, a 16th century Spanish priest, once said, what good will it do you if you give God one thing when he asks something else, consider what God wills and do it. For so will you satisfy your heart better than by doing that which you are inclined yourself. Don't worry, I've got more gems where that came from. But first, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, so that, as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Matthew chapters 21 and 22 mark the beginning of Passion Week. It's the time when Jesus and his human adversaries are most fiercely engaged, where the hidden motives are exposed, and where Jesus' mission is made plain. He is not just a teacher, a miracle worker, or an exorcist, not even simply a prophet. No. Jesus reveals by his words and deeds that he is truly the promised Messiah, the son of David and king of Israel. And in doing so, he also reveals that he is much more than the highest earthly imagining of the Messiah could fathom, for he is also the son of God. Now in response, the Pharisees and Sadducees seek to entangle him in his words in order to expose his ignorance of God's word and thus the falsity of his claim. But not only do they fail, but each attempt further exposes their inability to embrace the kingdom of God and their rebellion against the king. Whatever they might think of their own motives, we see that they are motivated by their enmity against God. The sad reality, saints, is that those who oppose the kingdom of God, no matter what they might think themselves doing, are doing so because they are captive to Satan and they therefore do his works. It does not matter that they even try to use scripture to justify their efforts to bend God's word to their own selfish aims. Jesus defines the kingdom of God. He defines what constitutes citizenship in the kingdom. He defines the law and morality of the kingdom. He determines the means of access into the kingdom. And he reveals how the kingdom functions and the purpose for which God established it. Anything that runs contrary to the word of Christ operates in rebellion against Christ. For example, when Saul, the first king of Israel, went his own way by preserving what God had commanded him to destroy, rather than trust in the word of the Lord through Samuel the prophet, Samuel revealed that such activity was not, quote, the exercise of freedom of choice, an alternative lifestyle, or anything else that we use to avoid calling it what it actually is, sin. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 22, and Samuel said, 
as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Now think about that. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you. See, we're inclined to think of the word of the Lord as that which we read, that which we hear. But above that stands him who is called the word. The word which was in the beginning, the word through which all things were made and apart from whom nothing was made that was made. The word that took flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The word that took our sins and carried them on the tree, becoming a curse for you and me. Praise God. Someone asked me the other day, well, aren't we saying when we say that, that Jesus became the sinner? And yes, I know that there are some great theologians who express that thought. That's why we pastors in the Lutheran church take a vow to our confessions, not to Luther. I said it. Like I said, I'm not trying to become a synodical president. But the Bible says that Jesus took our sin. He became sin for us. Now think about this for a moment. If it was an exact one-to-one -one exchange, if Jesus simply took your place and you took Jesus' place, that would be pretty good for you. It would suck for Jesus. Because that would mean that everything that falls upon you because of your sin, it now falls upon Christ. Including the wages of sin is death. The problem with that is, in the original equation, when you die in your sins, you rise to everlasting judgment. The next stop for those who died in rebellion against Christ is the lake of fire. So if Jesus simply took your place and that was the end of the story, guess what? You might end up in heaven, but guess where he ends up? And if that is not the ultimate injustice, I don't know what is. But the Bible says something else about him. And Peter preached it on that Pentecost Day sermon. It says that he said about David in the psalm, you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. Now, Peter goes on to say, now we know that David is dead and his tomb is with us to this day. But Jesus whom you crucified, he is risen. Oh yes, he's risen indeed. Praise God whom all blessings flow. And the reason he is risen is because death could not hold him. And the reason death could not hold him is because he is more holy than you are wicked. Amen. Praise God. That's right. He is more holy because he is holy. So much so that God was saying his word, you shall be holy because I am holy. Amen. You know, I actually jumped ahead of myself, but it seems so good. I just had to ride this thing. Y'all don't mind, do you? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Because in our first reading today, in Leviticus, those words are spoken. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy. For I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And holiness is not just a word about dress codes. It is not just about exclusions from things that perish with the using. That's right, I said it. Holiness is not about how short your dress is or what kind of stuff you drink. Because all of that stuff, when you die, it goes with you. 
Holiness is the recognition that God transforms the things that he possesses. Say, I'm transformed. Praise God. The things he possesses, he transforms and makes them special. And not special on the basis of what they did or special on the basis of what he saw concerning them, but special by virtue of the fact that he claims ownership. Oh, no, no, I know that there are those who say, well, God saved you because he looked into the future and saw that you would believe. Oh, no, 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 no. God's not dependent on you that way. You're dependent on God. God's not sitting there with bated breath, sitting on his throne with Christ at his side saying, well, I, 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 I think, that, yeah, I believe that one is going to. And I think that one is going to, nor is he sitting there like a dealer at a Las Vegas table dealing out cards and whatever card you get, that's what you are. Huh. In fact, the Bible doesn't tell us how God does it. Doesn't tell us why he does it other than to say he did it because he loved you. And because he loved you, he does not desire any man to perish. Because he loved you, he sent his son for God so loved the world. Not just the smart ones, not just the theologically inclined ones, but the world that he sent his son. God so loved you that he made it simple. He didn't ask you to be able to pass an exam. He did not ask you to show him that you deserved it. He simply said, repent and believe the gospel. Oh, I love God's word. You know, there's nothing that belongs to him is common. Nothing. Because he is not common. When God says, you shall be holy, he's saying that you shall no longer see yourselves as common. Say that to yourself, I'm not common. And I'm not talking about the singer. Oh, well, you're not him either. But I mean, you're not ordinary. You're not something that can be thrown out with the trash and replaced at a whim. You're not just a number or another brick in the wall. You're special because God owns you. He's saying that you shall see what God sees, that you are his child, marked out by the water, the blood, and the spirit, as John wrote in 1 John chapter 5, for there are three that testify, not just one, but three, the spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree, give God a praise. Now, in our second reading, Paul shows his understanding of the purpose of ministry. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The call of God into his own kingdom. That is the message of the gospel. So powerful that Paul calls it the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So certain is the gospel in its power and purpose that whoever believes that is baptized will be saved. And there's only one right response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, faith. And this simple childlike response is the one thing, though, that the Pharisees could not do. Instead, they tried to dismiss the message and the messenger. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Notice Jesus does not dismiss or, dis or diminish the will of God. You all know that the law of God expresses his will, amen? It tells you what God wants concerning you. Jesus doesn't tell us that God's word no longer has God's attention. In fact, he is still watching over his word to perform it. it Jesus doesn't say to us that God has conceded to Satan that we will not be holy, that we will not be conformed to his image, that he must accept rebellion and sin as the price of having us in his family. Jesus don't say none of that. People say that. When people say, oh, he knows my heart, that's what they're saying. When people say, who are you to judge me? When you simply tell them what the Lord says in his word, that's what they're saying to you. But Jesus don't say that. In fact, Jesus goes further than that. In his response to the Pharisee lawyer, Jesus lays the foundation for our trust in him as our Savior and our Lord. Jesus asked him a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Oh, the son of David. They didn't have a problem with saying that. And then he said to him, well, then how is it that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, till I put your enemies under your feet. The text that he quotes is from Psalm 110. And the thing is, scholars tell us that there was no Jewish commentary either at that time or for a hundred years afterward that made mention of Psalm 110 as being messianic. Jesus was the first person, apparently, who ever attached that significance to those words. And he wasn't lying. Because not only is Jesus David's son, he is the son of God. He is not simply a glorious relic of an ancient past with no relevance or no relevance to today. But as it is written in Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. The word that the father gave to his son that he would put his enemies under his feet was as certain as the word that brought light out of darkness and created the heavens and earth out of nothing. As certain as you are of the earth's existence, this moment as you sit in those pews, as you sit in your chair at home or wherever you are, that's how certain you can be of Christ's death and resurrection for you and of the Spirit's indwelling and sanctification of you to the praise of his glorious grace, as Paul wrote in Philippians 1, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Then he further said in the second chapter, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. Oh, God, so rich in mercy, he didn't just give you his commandments that you might know what he wants, but he looked beyond your faults, saw your needs, and supplied them, giving you the Holy Spirit to preserve you to strengthen you, to enable you, even as you walk in the path of good work that God has prepared beforehand for you. You know, that's why you can't really judge another person's walk in the sense of comparing it to your walk. Because the path that God has laid for you is your path. The path that God has laid for your neighbor is their path. But those two paths work together for good when they are God's path, amen? See, when we are walking on God's path, each of us fulfilling our vocation, we are working towards that common good. 
We are working towards that day when Christ returns with all power in his hand, with all authority on heaven and earth, and he begins to say, well done, good and faithful. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are entrepreneurs. Some of us are public servants. Some of us are homemakers. Some of us might be ditch diggers and some of us might be CEOs. But when we're doing what God has given us to do, we're all working towards that unity in the spirit in Christ. And that's the goal of God. That's the purpose of God saves us, not simply so that we can avoid hell, but saves us into an everlasting kingdom that we might experience the love that he has for us and share that love with one another. That I can serve you for Christ's sake and you can serve me in Jesus' name. That we can walk together, break bread together, drink wine together, worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. Oh, praise God. Yes, we, we do celebrate so many things today. We celebrate 150 years of ministry together. We celebrate the day when the light of the gospel was once again bursting forth from the darkness of human tradition. We celebrate the Lord's day today. For this is the day the Lord has made. So let the peace of God today that passes all understanding. Today, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.